is Big Town. Starring Mark Stevens. Presented by the new Life Boy with its new pleasing fragrance that stops B.O. from bath to bath for even as long as three days. And new Rinso Blue, the complete detergent that gets white clothes extra white because it blues as it washes. My name is Steve Wilson. I'm editor of this newspaper, where from the half million words processed here daily come true stories about real people reported by working newspaper men. These are factual accounts. Nothing has been changed except the name of the city and the identity of the people to respect the right of privacy. This is a rifle. This is a silencer. This is a telescopic sight. This is the Illustrated Press building. This is a gun barrel. This is a cop. A dead cop. When this story crossed my desk, I had a hunch it was going to be unusual. In a moment, you'll see what I mean. But right now, here's an experience I had. Hey, Trudy. Hey, wake up. Why? You're Mark Stevens, and you're going to do the Life Boy commercial. I know all about it. And you know that Life Boy's medicinal odor is gone? Of course. And you also know that Life Boy smells as pleasant as any beauty soap? Sure. And you use it? No. Please, Trudy, the sponsor is listening. Well, sorry, but I want a soap that gives me the best protection. Listen, Trudy, Life Boy gives you far longer protection than special deodorant soaps that cost a lot more. You're kidding. Look. Life Boy has a new deodorizing discovery called Purilin. A famous hospital just proved that Purilin gives you better and longer protection against the cause of B.O. than anything that's ever been put in soap. Why, Lever Brothers unconditionally guarantees that Life Boy protects you as long as three days. Well, that's for me. Here, try the new Life Boy yourself. It makes high-priced deodorant soaps old-fashioned. I'd been checking the page when I got a flash that Charlie was trying to contact me. Sniper? Yes, yeah, Steve. Killed another cop. Where this time? Right across the street. Dave Dixon, that nice guy. He's been on that corner for years. Headquarters got anything on it? If they have, they're not telling. Maybe you can get a lead. Sergeant Ward is waiting in your office. He must be in a fine humor. That's the third cop in six months. Any ideas for our... Why don't we have the art department do one of those reconstruction things, you know, faceless figure, dotted lines? Yeah, it might help. It's funny. Nobody seems to get excited when a cop gets killed. Now, if there was a good-looking dame mixed up in it... There is. Who? The cop's wife. That's a bad day, Jim. Anybody have any reason to kill this particular cop? No, yeah, none I can figure out. Oh, I might have given a few tickets for double parking. Married, two kids. There's no pattern to it. Three cops, three different departments, different ages, ratings, records. How can I help? Not sure, Steve. But a high-powered rifle. Bullet went right through the temple. So whoever did it, it's a dead shot. Did you find the bullet? Yeah, it's 30 caliber. Good markings. Lodged in a door jam. Could have been fired any place in the neighborhood as long as it was high up. I'll check this building for you. What time did it happen? About 11 o'clock. All right, now I've got to go tell Dave Dixon's wife how it happened. I don't even know myself. You remember her, don't you? Big-eyed girl. She worked relief in the cafeteria down the street. Come go with me. She might need her job back. Jim and I had hoped that when we talked to Dave Dixon's wife, we could find the words to tell her how we felt. Come in, Sergeant Ward. Martha. Oh, you know Steve Wilson, don't you? Illustrated Press. Yes, I know Mr. Wilson. But I, I didn't want to talk to any newspaper men now. I'm sorry, Mrs. Dixon. I was hoping you'd talk to me. I knew your husband. In fact, I remember when you met him. on the curb 
up waiting for some cars to turn right. I started to walk across the street and got caught between signals. I heard him whistle several times. You know that shrill, startling police whistle? I expected at least an official call down. I turned and started to run back, and then I suddenly realized that everything had stopped moving. Dave was holding back traffic in all directions till I recovered. I don't think I ever recovered, really. Ten days later, we were married. Thanks, Mr. Wilson, for, for reminding me. Please excuse me for crying, but I just haven't been able to until now. <laughs> We think the sniper killed Dave. And we think the sniper is an insane murderer with a mania for killing cops. But I've got to ask you a few questions. I understand, Sergeant. Do you know any reason why it should be otherwise? Why anybody but a crazy man would kill Dave? I don't think anybody in the world had a, had a grudge against Dave, either real or fancied. It must have been done by somebody that didn't know him. We've been married almost 10 years. Some of them have been bitter years of sickness and bad breaks. Trying to make a cop's salary cover everything. But through every one of them, not one bit of the luster of my first impression, Dave Dixon's worn off. Please, Mr. Wilson. Don't let this be just another killing in the line of duty that your readers will glance over and dismiss. T tell them about Dave. Tell them about me. Tell them about Dave Jr. and little Marty. Tell them cops die just as hard as anybody else. Their deaths mean just as much misery to their families as the deaths of anybody what a pitiful waste it is for a man to be shot down for no reason at all. Tell it to them in a way that it, it won't mean just another headline with morning coffee. Make people understand that cops are people, too. Hello, Mommy. Hiya, gang. You know Sergeant Ward? Hi, you, Dave. Marty. And Mr. Wilson. What's the matter, Mommy? It's about Daddy. Yes, it's about Daddy. I, I have some after-school sandwiches out in the kitchen. We'll have a huddle. Will you excuse us, gentlemen? Us Dixons have something to talk over. Superman would be used to scenes like the one I'd just left, but it didn't work out that way. True, it was just another story, but every part of it reminded me of Mrs. Dixon and those children. Even the art department reconstruction of the killing, a graphic tie-up of the way it might have happened. Nobody knew for sure, and unless we found something to go on, we weren't going to know now. What happened to you? I just went a purple heart. How? Oh. Cut my foot on a piece of glass. Line of duty? I should say. Two of the girls and I were taking a sunbath on the roof. Yeah, what time? A few minutes after 12. We go up there every lunch hour. All right, since you're wounded, take it easy. The cops are searching every building in this block for the sniper. Grab a photog, do one of those rambling reporter things. Ask people what they think of the sniper. On this foot? Unless you can think of a better way, yes. Now go on, check with Charlie. I had the broken glass on the roof picked up and brought down to my office. You know where the girls take their sunbaths? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, quit kidding. I heard about it way out in Stonewall Center. Oh, yeah, come to think of it, I did hear something about it. Nice, clean place? Well, the janitors go over it every morning about 9.30. You know what a bug the Commodore is about one little scrap of paper on the roof. Well, Lori cut her foot up there on a piece of glass. See if you can find out how it got there. Well, it could be a piece of lens out of somebody's glasses. Well, see if any of our people were up there this morning besides Lori and the sunbathers. Sure, Steve. Oh, and I'll pass the word on to all the departments. What time did Lori cut her foot? Uh, about 
Mm-hmm. Well, the roof was cleaned by 10. The cop was killed by 11. That means somebody was on our roof between the time it was cleaned and the time the cop was killed. Well, that's the idea. Find out who it was. Somebody might have seen or heard something that could lead to the sniper. Might be the sniper himself. No such luck, Rush. Probably a nearsighted proofreader eating a peanut butter sandwich. Probably. We couldn't write a better story, so I quoted the wife of the dead policeman, word for word. About that glass, Steve. Nobody on the paper broke their glasses. Nobody admits being on the roof except Laurie and the other two girls. It's a funny one. Well, they grind glasses on prescription, don't they? They do if they're tailor-made, fitted by a doctor. I'll see what you can find out. You're sure it's tied up with the sniper? I don't know. Jim Ward says Dave Dixon could have been killed from our roof. I don't see how, but I still don't want to overlook the possibility. Laurie and Rush were making a systematic check of optical houses. It was Laurie's turn to get lucky. Her second stop was the Superb Optical Company. There she found out two things. First, the broken lens we'd picked up on the roof of the Illustrated Press was precision ground. Second, the glasses had been made for a Miss May Marlowe commercial artist. It was no trick to find out her address, an apartment building in the better part of town. It didn't lock, darling. you uh, darling I don't mind that I call everybody darling take five Jenny darling what can I do for you my name is Wilson from the Illustrated Press this is Miss Kilborn oh newspaper people how do you do well if it's an assignment you'll have to talk to my agent if it's an interview on commercial art he'll arrange that too now if you'll excuse me it isn't either of those Miss Marlowe as we came down the corridor we saw a man turning away from the door Probably a magazine salesman they do get into the building, you know. You must have frightened him away. No doubt. Now, if you'll excuse me. Uh, just one more question. A little one? About as big as a piece of lens from your glasses. My glasses? I cut my foot on it. Where? Up on the roof of the Illustrated Press building. Now, how in the world could a pair of my glasses get onto the roof of the Illustrated Press building? Well, somebody carried them there. Who? I have several pairs of glasses. This pair, which you can see, is unbroken. That pair with the telephone. There's another pair on my nightstand by the bed. But I can't see how a pair could possibly get onto the roof of the Illustrated Press building. You, uh, you didn't ask when we found a piece of lens. All right. When did you? About an hour after a policeman was killed. Across the street. Now, if you'll excuse us. We went back to the paper, convinced that May Marlowe was lying to us. The clips I found in our morgue showed Miss Marlowe to be just what she claimed she was, a commercial artist, unmarried, independent, successful. Then the break came. Laurie had scored again. Go on the glasses, Steve. I went back to the optical company, and a messenger had brought in a pair of May Marlowe's glasses to be fixed. You talked to the messenger? No, I did better than that. While I was talking to the man in the optical company, the messenger came back to pick up the glasses. Before they were fixed? Yes, he said he made a mistake. When he left with the glasses, I followed him. Went back to May Marlowe's? No, to the office of Mr. Henry Howard in the Baker building. The name Henry Howard rang a faint bell to me. I decided to see what we had in the file about him. We had plenty, all strictly solid citizen, except for one interesting thing. He was the man we'd seen leaving May Marlowe's apartment. Uh-uh, honey. You told me to get a box of detergent. But not just any old detergent. I want the new Rinso Blue. Do you know how I've been getting your white shirt so extra white? Why our white towels are so extra white? Why our sheets look so extra white? Because Rinso Blue blues as it washes? Good boy. It washes whiter because it blues as it washes right in our washing machine. 
Let's go home. I don't have to add any bluing because new Rinso Blue does the bluing. And our white things come out extra white. And Rinso Blue is great for dishes and glasses, too. No fooling. Unless your present detergent blues as it washes, it's doing only half the job. Rinso Blue really blues as it washes. Yes, new Rinso Blue washes whiter because it blues as it washes, and that is unconditionally guaranteed by Lever Brothers. Henry Howard, May Marlowe, and the broken eyeglasses. A real tie-up. Nothing we could print yet, but certainly worth the trip to see Mr. Howard. Mr. Howard? Steve Wilson. Oh, come in, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Want to fix your drink? No, thanks, sir. Well, make yourself comfortable. Thanks. This is horribly disappointing. She didn't meet you, but she's out of the house right now. What can I do for you? Well, if you could answer a few questions, Mr. Howard. Far away. Anytime I can help the Illustrated Press, well, I'll try it. <laughs> I have to keep Chick Dahlgren in funds, you know, so he can pay off his golf debts. Chick Dahlgren? Our sports editor? You and uh, Chick play often, Mr. Howard? Sure. Every time I can get away from that paper. Let's see, we played uh, Hilltop last Wednesday. Last Wednesday? Yeah, I, uh, I picked him up at his office about, uh, oh, down at the paper around 10.30 in the morning, and we made a day of it. Oh, well, that explains what I came to ask you about, Mr. Howard. A pair of glasses belonging to May Marlowe. They were delivered to your office from the Superba Optical Company. They were? Yes, a piece of lens from those glasses was found on the roof of the Illustrated Press building last Wednesday. We were wondering how it got there, but since you went across the roof to Chick's office... Hold on a minute, Wilson. You don't have to go across the roof to get to Chick's office. Just take the elevator to the top floor and walk up the stairs. Yes, sir. One of our reporters had a lead on the story. I told him I'd check it for him. Wait a minute. Wednesday. Well, that's the day that policeman was killed. And you think the shot was fired from the roof of the Illustrated Press building? Yes, that's the idea. Well, I can assure you, if it were, I had nothing to do with it. I'm scared to death of firearms, Mr. Wilson. That's a good way to be, sir. I'll, uh, I'll check with my secretary about that, uh, about the glasses, see if I can help you. Now, if you would, please, I'd appreciate it. Oh, I want to help. You know, this, um, this sniper business has got everybody at route order, hasn't it? Yes, sir, that it does. Well, thank you very much for your courtesy, Mr. Hart. Good day, sir. <laughs> I'd phoned Sergeant Ward and asked him to meet me in my office. How'd it go? Might have something. Yes. Rose, get me Chick Dalgren, will you? He isn't in his office, Steve, but I've got a number where you can reach him. Okay, locate him for me and call me on four. What'd you find out about May Marlowe? Nothing, Steve, but I got some dope on Mrs. Henry Howard, though. Where is she? Reno. Jake, did you play golf with Mr. Henry Howard last Wednesday? What time? At Hilltop? Oh, is he a member there? What club does he belong to? Lakeview? I'm not sure, Chick. Maybe important. Thanks. Rose? Yes, Mr. Wilson? Get uh, Lee Luke up here for me, will you, right away? Yes, sir. Jim, how do you stand, Reno? Well, good enough to find out what Mrs. Howard's doing there. Come on in, Lee. You know Jim Ward, Sergeant of Police? Sergeant? He's our chief elevator operator. Here's a picture of Mr. Henry Howard. Have you seen him lately? I don't know. Has he been around? When he played golf with Chick Dahlgren last Wednesday morning, he said he picked him up about 10.30. Now I remember him. He carried his own golf bag. Why did he do that? Well, Chick says they left here in a taxi. They played Chick's club. Howard would have to bring his bag from Lakeview. Something funny happened on the top floor now that I think about it. Bradley. You know, there are two doors at the end of the corridor. One leads to the stairs that lead up to Mr. Dahlgren's office. The other leads out onto the roof. He took the one that leads to the roof. I went after him to tell him about his mistake, but the buzzer in the car started doing nip ups, and so I took her down. You don't know if he came back that way? No, sir. That was a relief run for me. When I got down to the lobby, Shorty was back on the job. Okay, Lee. Thanks a lot. Any way you get from the roof to Dahlgren's office without going back through that corridor door? Yeah. But you'd have to know about it to find it. We waited, neither one of us mentioning the real thing on our mind, where and when the sniper would strike again. 
I'm holding space for the sniper story, Steve. What about it? Well, there's nothing new for sure, Charlie. Charlie, did you ever hear the expression, route order? How was it used? Well, the sniper business seems to have everybody at route order. <laughs> sure, I've heard it, but not for 25 years. It's a cavalry command, the opposite of attention. Men ride along easy, smoke, talk. We used to have words to all the bugle calls. Route order is a four-note call, and the words to it are, get loose and loud. Like the police force. OK, thanks. Sergeant Ward went his way, and I went mine, to the Lakewood Golf Club. A buck or two in the right places always seems to open things up. This included Henry Howard's locker. I spotted something that might be useful to Sergeant Ward. So I sent the attendant to check the golf shop for me. When the locker boy came back, he brought the information I expected. Howard's golf sticks were not here at the club. My hunch had paid off. Sergeant Ward has sent the glass to the police lab. Leighton Prince brought out a set of beauties. So I invited Henry Howard to pay me a visit. He was on his way over. Yes, Rose? Mr. Howard to see you. All right, Sam, will you? Right. Oh, Mr. Howard, nice of you to drop in. Sit down, won't you, sir? Well, as I told you the other night, anything for the Illustrated Press. How's check? Oh, fine. He was quite interested when I told him about you. Sounds like he's ready for another round. Maybe we could hurry this up and get upstairs. I don't know why not. I just wanted to check a few things we left up in the air. For instance, uh, you told me that you were very much afraid of firearms. Well, isn't everybody? Especially when they find themselves on the wrong end. Um, there was no occasion for you to be on the wrong end. You were a member of the cavalry team that fired the national matches at Camp Perry 25 years ago. See, my past is catching up with me. What else did you find out? That you made expert every year you were in the service. It used to be worth five dollars a month extra. Are you still harping on that cop killing? See you in a minute, Steve. Sure, Rush. Excuse me, will you, Mr. Howell? Found this in the luggage compartment of his car. Looks like he's ready for business again. Old army rifle, 30 caliber, model R3. Old action. That is an all. Silencer. A telescopic sight. All right, let's go put in the stitches. Rush, tell Charlie to remake the front page. Get the art on hard, grab a photo and come right back. I see you found my little toys. You, uh, you want to tell us about it? What's that to tell? It's just what I said, toys. We've got the bullet to kill the officer across the street. Now, I can send it in this rifle to ballistics if you want to waste time. You're entitled to a lawyer if you want to call one. No. He just said I was crazy. And that's one thing I'm not. Crazy. At the beginning, maybe I was a little crazy. But not lately. These last few years have been the most exciting, stimulating time of my life. I was a man apart. A superior being in a world of mediocrities, walking around with this wonderful secret, unable to tell anyone. You can tell us. Suppose you start the beginning. The beginning was with my brother back in Missouri. One night, he and his wife went to a show. When they came out of the theater, two men rushed out of a jewelry store next door. One of them was the proprietor, chasing the other, yelling, stop thief. A trigger-happy cop on the corner started shooting. Uh, when the excitement died down, the thief escaped and my brother was dead. You can read all about it in the St. Louis papers. Ten days later, I killed my first cop. You get even with the world? An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Why did you keep on killing? When that cop fell, I... I realized the supreme thrill I was on Mount Olympus with the immortals, giving and taking life. I used to watch cops picking my next victim, delighting in their 
their unsuspecting trust in me. Aren't you ever in danger of discovery? Never. Nobody seemed to care they died, except other cops. They were so far behind my superior intelligence that they never even suspected. Until I dropped a pair of glasses, forgot to pick up the pieces. How come you had the glasses with you? Oh, when I saw Miss Marlowe that day, I carelessly knocked her glasses off, and I, I wanted to have them repaired. You might say that I was trapped by a, well, a decent impulse. There's a lesson in that. There might be. Your wife's in Reno for a divorce. Oh, well, she's too high strung to be married to a genius. How many cops did you kill, genius? Four. One in St. Louis and three here. I, uh, I wish I had waited a couple of weeks before I had my decent impulse. Why? I wanted to make it an even half dozen. <laughs> In this state, first-degree murder means death. Wilson. Hello, Miss Dixon. I read your story, Mr. Wilson. I knew it had to be something like that, but it's good to be sure. That is that. How are the children? They're in bed asleep. Of course, they'll miss their father, but children recover quickly. Thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Bye, right, Miss Dixon. Nice talking to you. If there's anything I can do, let me know. Bye. Good girl, Dave Dixon's widow. I'm sure we told her story. I hope we made everybody understand. Like she said, cops are people. Now, from the city room of the Illustrated Press, let's look in on automotive editor Jim Roberts. Well, thanks, Perry. Say, I uh, just ran across an interesting AC ad. A hot tip for smart drivers. Clever, isn't it? It tells an important story to drivers, too. It explains why AC spark plugs are so much better. Here's the hot tip they're talking about. You'll only find this feature on AC plugs. The thin insulator tip down here gets hot fast, and with this recess, it gets hot faster. That lets it burn away harmful deposits that would foul up ordinary thick-tip plugs. Yes, the AC horse, Sparky, does give drivers a hot tip in this ad. So if you want lively plugs for lively performance from your car, get yourself a set of lively new AC spark plugs. Boy, you'll be amazed and pleased at the difference. just seen is based on factual account. Only the names of the people in the cities have been changed to respect the right of privacy. Big Town is presented by Lever Brothers, the makers of the new Life Boy and Rinso Blue, which are unconditionally guaranteed to perform as stated or your money will be refunded.